Hi, I'm Richard Cutland, and welcome to a brand new podcast, Tank Nuts, where I get the chance to sit down and chat with a wide variety of people. Veterans, stuntmen, serving soldiers. In fact, a whole host of people, but all with one thing in common, a love and passion for armour. Hello and welcome to Tank Nuts. Now today's guest, you may never have heard of his name before. However, I absolutely guarantee that you would have at least seen some of the things he's been involved with, i.e. movie-wise, or some of the series that he's been part of. Now, in front of me, a bit of a list and some of the 204 credits to his name. And these include a host of Bond films, Star Wars, Harry Potter, Saving Private Ryan, A Bridge Too Far, Where Eagles Dare, The Dirty Dozen, Top Gear, the series, one of my favourites, and more recently, Fury. So it is with great delight that I'd like to introduce today one of Britain's leading stuntmen, Mr Jim Dowdle. How are you, sir? Good morning, Richard. I'm fine. Thank you very much. Nice to be here. Thank you very much for coming. So that's quite a list there, Jim. It's, uh, we were talking earlier about the 204 credits. Do you think that's about accurate, or is there a lot more involved there? Well, as though that doesn't include uh, commercials, I've done... 280 car commercials and 340 miscellaneous commercials and live shows and jousted in America and you know, there's lots of stuff that doesn't go on on the IMDb simply because they're not interested in you know a lot of the stuff that that we do or it doesn't it doesn't get credited. I don't know how they put it all together all that list, but there's a lot more there. I could bore you for hours with it. Good heavens! And now. Getting to understand, Jim, now obviously for a lot of us listening to this, it's how on earth did that sort of like become a stuntman in the first place? Now obviously I've looked a bit of your bio. Um, when did you first get into it and your very first job you've got to tell us about because this is absolutely incredible. I left school at 16 with one O level and joined the circus. I worked for a lion trainer called Gerd Simeone. <laughs> the way you say it though, it's like it's a normal thing to do. I left well, school at 16 and joined the circus. <laughs> but yeah, well, yeah. I, you know, it's that old thing about my mother kept on saying, you'll never get, your life will never treat you well unless you've got five O-levels and two A-levels. And I was never going to get five O-levels and two A-levels as long as, I, you know, I've got a hole in my ass. So um, I, at 16, I wasn't going to go on the dole because there was a real thing about being on the dole. And now now everybody does it. But then there was, there was a stigma about actually mm. claiming oh, the yeah. dole. And I thought, I'm not going to do that. And I thought, well, that's it's the time, beginning of the summer. Let's have a go at that. Anyway, cut a long story short, I worked for this lion trainer and I did a little bit of acrobatic because I was a gymnast at, at school. I was Sussex schoolboys gymnastics champion and therefore that was what I was good at. And so, and, and then when the, when the circus finished at the end of the season, then I went and did a whole series of jobs. I worked in a motorcycle company called Pride and Clark and learned how to strip down old bikes and learned about engines and all that kind of stuff. And I worked as a were washing cars for a car hire company. I worked in Harrods over Christmas, packing toys. Um, I drove a minicab. I did. It was just fun, you know. You could the jobs were easy in those days. You could pick mm, work up, yeah. no problem. Little bits of casual work and all that kind of stuff. And then um, at, the, at the end of, of one year, I got the sack from Harrods for smoking on the escalator because <laughs> I was a member of staff and staff weren't allowed, everybody else could have a cigar with a tripod on it, you know, but um, staff weren't allowed to smoke on the, on the thing. And uh, my sister was working for Pennell's History of the Second World War as a picture editor and she knew about as much about the Second World War pictures as I do about rocket research. So I would go in there because I was very interested historically and say, this is what that is, that's that type of tank or that's that type of gun or whatever it is, and it's this campaign, and, and so I was helping her. And they were getting photographs from a company in London called Baptiste, and Baptiste are film suppliers who supply everything from a, a flick knife to an anti-tank gun, anything, swords, guns, anything you like on the military side. And um, they were looking for a, 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 an assistant armourer, I knew nothing practically about because I hadn't been in the military at that point. But I got the job there. And after a few weeks of learning bits and pieces, I got taken onto the set as an assistant armourer on the Dirty Dozen. Wow. Which so was, what, what age were you then? This is uh, I would have been about 19. Wow. Um, and keen as mustard, but didn't know anything from anything. And the first day on the film... I was told to go around and show 
the actors, uh, some of the actors, what weapons they would be using. So I go to Donald Sutherland's room, and he's going, oh, yeah, man. It was just like his character in Kelly's Heroes. He was a hippie <laughs> in real life, really. And he said, oh, yeah, man, show me how it's done, blah, blah, blah. Charles Bronson said, I know how to shoot guns, kid. Get the hell out of here. So, all right, that's something. And then I go to Lee Marvin's room. Now, Lee Marvin is, you know, quite a serious star, but I don't know anything about his history. So I, on the thing, you know, and I get this gruff voice and, yep. So I go and it's addressing, it's 10 o'clock in the morning and there's Lee Marvin sitting with his feet up on the table, smoking a big cigar and he's got a half a bottle of Jack Daniels in front of him. It's 10 o'clock in the morning. I said, what do you want, kid? I said, I'm Jim, so I'm the assistant armorer. I come to show you the, the weapons you'll be using on the film. And this glint comes into his eye. I don't know what's going on. Very naive at that point. It's, it, I still am. And st- uh, g- g- go into the dressing room and I've got this M3 grease gun. 45 thing and he said okay kid do your thing so I start going through the routine with this like this guy's never fired a gun before and it's pay I'm giving the page you have to be very careful where, which way you point it and the empties come out of the right hand side and they're quite hot with it because you have to be careful and he's going oh really okay that's fine now. and now he's he's sitting down and I'm up there so the eye line is like this so he says so let me take a look at that kid so he takes the weapon off me and now he's engaging with me eye to eye and he starts to strip the gun down without looking at it right and he puts it on the table in its four component parts right and then he looks down at it and i look down at it and then he he looks up again and starts conversing and he puts it back together again without looking at it and then he cocks it and then hands me the magazine and i i take this and i go right okay <laughs> feeling like this now <laughs> this high and for the rest of the movie, because he was, A, he was a, a Marine who was wounded in, in the Pacific, and secondly, and he was decorated, and he was a gun nut. He loved guns. So him and I used to talk guns. And for, for a, a guy like myself, 19 years old, to be able to talk to Lee Marvin on a level about weapons and things was a real privilege. Wow. But he used, to, he used to get seriously pissed, and by about middle of the afternoon, he was pretty much gone. But he would always, like a good soldier, carry his weapon with him. And he would always say, the prop man would say, you know, do you want me to take you? No, where's Jimmy? And he would always cock the weapon, take the mag out, and show it to me, and hand hand the gunner. However drunk he was, he never left that weapon anywhere. Whereas Bronson, at the end of the, at the you know, when at the end of the shot, he'd literally take his gun off and he'd throw it on the ground and <laughs> walk away. Yeah, yeah, he couldn't, <laughs> couldn't give a shit. Not a very nice man. And uh, 20 years later, we were doing the Dirty Dozen Next Mission, which was a made-for-TV show. Yeah, I remember show. that. Yeah, ah, yeah, a dreadful yeah. piece of junk. So now I'm a stuntman. It's 20 years on from there. And I go there to do a job to flip a motorcycle, a sidecar outfit, which we would um, rig by putting... Uh, we would weld a tire iron on the front of the sidecar so that it was just about an inch and a half off the surface of the road, fill the front of the sidecar up with bags of sand so that you came into where you want it to happen, you yanked the handlebars, the weight would, would push the, the, the sidecar nose down, the, the tire iron would dig into the ground and that would flip the bike over the sidecar. So I've gone there to do this job. So I'm dressed in a German, you know, one of those long motorcycle coats, I've got a helmet, it's winter, it's cold, I'm on the dining bus, just going, and I and I can feel somebody's looking at, and I look at the end of the dining bus, and there's Lee Marvin right down the end, and he looks at me, and and he does that whole deal with with cocking the weapon, <laughs> taking it and handing it to me, and then points at me, and he goes, "It's you, isn't it?" And I thought, you know, that was one of the great moments that he should have remembered me, from you know, because they, you know, these are big serious stars. Oh, Twenty years later, yeah. it was just a wonderful moment. Anyway, sorry, that was a long way of saying. So the Dirty Dozen was one of the, was, was the first one. And then after that, uh, we went out to Austria for four months to do Where Eagles Dare with, um, you know, Clint Eastwood. True classic and, movie. Yes, and, and Richard Burton. And we had an amazing time out there. And, I mean, that was a real, um, it was just an extraordinary experience. I mean, really extraordinary experience. And, of course, Clint Eastwood had just done the dollar film, so he was climbing up the ladder mm, very oh, seriously. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but Richard Burton was, again, this huge huge megastar married to Elizabeth Taylor and um, <laughs> and uh, he again was very severely into the bottom of the bottle by about two or three o'clock in the afternoon and uh, we'd done a shot in in uh, in Austria which had been we'd had a whiteout there'd been a blizzard and we couldn't get it 
So we had to reproduce, reproduce this in the studio. So we had a telegraph pole halfway up a slope with, sa- with, with was supposed to be snow on it, which is actually just salt. And they just wanted one line of dialogue. And we were trying to get Clint Eastwood finished because he had to get back. We were way overdue, and his, I think his wife was going to have the first child. So we were working till 9 or 10 o'clock at night, by which time Burton was pissed as a rat. And so we, uh, the cameras are down the bottom of this slope, and I'm up the top to hand them the guns as they go onto the set, and then as they come off, I take the guns off them. And um, Burton has got one line. He's, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, 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 cut. Uh, again, Richard. Uh, anyway, this is going on. We've done like 11 takes like this, and everybody wants to just go home, right? And now Elizabeth Taylor has appeared because she used to come and pick him up on the set. So she's behind the camera, and you could tell when she came. There was an amazing presence that lady had. And eventually he says from the top, he says, Elizabeth, are you there? And this little disconnected voice comes from behind him. Yes, Richard. Elizabeth, I don't seem to be able to get this line. What do you suggest I do? And this voice from behind the camera said, why didn't you try acting, you big CU, <clears throat> if you know how, and then we could all get the F out of here and go home? And he said, oh. The next time he did it, he was word perfect. It was extra- It was absolutely extraordinary. We got the take. Thank you very much. Check the gate. Go home. Power, power of the wife, you see. Isn't it? Yeah. The power but of the it wife. Was, I mean, she was an extraordinary presence. You know, he just bought her that ring, which was a million dollars. To marry her, I think for the second or the third, I got lost count, you know. And she, she was great. She came in the next because it was on the front page of all the papers. And she came in the next day with this ring on and, you know, this big glaring diamond. She said, oh, "Look, here it is," and everything else. And one of the chippies got a saw out and he started chasing it around the stage and said, "Let's see if it's real or it's glass," you know. <laughs> and she was play, she played the game, ran around the stage and do all that kind of stuff. Very different times. And you, so you were still an armourer at this stage. Yes. So how do you make the transition then from doing the armourer to do you just suddenly wake up one day and thought, do you know what? Do you know, I thought I could be doing this in 40 years' time. I don't want to be an armourer in 40 oh, okay, years' time. Yeah. And after three years of having this extraordinary time, I thought it was time to move on. So I left and I drove a cab for a bit and then I thought I think I'd join the army because my dad was at Arnhem and he always went on about Arnhem and paratroopers and all that. And I thought, okay. So I went and, and joined up, and I did P Company, and I got in, and and, uh, and it was at a time in 1970 when there was, you know, the British Army was being cut to ribbons financially, and it was a Labour government, and there was very few aircraft allocations, and the only service you either saw was in Northern Ireland, which was a horrible posting anyway, because it was after Warren Point, and I was in one para, and it was after our boys had been blown up there, and or you went to Germany. Either way, it was not an exciting time, but we we. Um, we did a uh, a night exercise, and I hurt my back. I impacted two vertebrae in the base of my spine, and they said that's it for you. No more jumping. So you lose your bounty. You don't get any. You know, get extra money for jumping. And and they said, well, you know, we'll send you on a driver's course. And you can learn to drive a truck. And I, uh, yeah, can't wait. You know, um, should become a tank. And the CO, you? no, but the CO, bless his heart, to this day, said. I don't think this is a bit of you, is it? And I said, I'm not really so. And he said, I think we'll give you a, a medical discharge. And, and to this day, I, I, you know, I worship that man. And so I left with a, you know, with a medical discharge after about 19, 20, 21 months. Having learnt a little bit, but not enough. And I thought, well, I'll go back and I'll drive a cab again. But I, previously, I'd met all these stuntmen on, on these other shows. And I thought, that's what I'd like to be doing. And at that time, there was a thing called the Stunt Register had just been formed in 1973. And to get onto the Stunt Register, because all the stuntmen at that time used to either, they would be extras one day, and then they'd say, right, who wants to do the stair fall tomorrow? And some of the guys would put, oh, yeah, I'll do the stair fall, I'll crash the car. And it was, it was all very much like that. And then the guys who used to do that stunt work said, we need to be a, a, a specialised body. We need to stop doing extra work, and we need to stop extras doing stunt work. Oh, OK, yeah, yeah. So they formed the stunt register, and to get onto the stunt register, you needed two stunt contracts. That's all you needed. And I had two stunt contracts. So I managed to get on. And it was really interesting, because all of a sudden, my potential income of doing crowd work, doing extra work, finished. And these guys were well-established stuntmen, and they were not going to let a young pretender in. So I was really stuck 
to get work. And I got the odd day here and then. I was doing work on the BBC. And then I got the job doubling Pike on Dad's Army, <laughs> right? So I got a little bit of work there. And I did a couple of jobs that, you know, and the word gets around and, and all that kind of stuff. So I started getting a bit of TV work. And then a friend of mine was working for um, a producer and uh, they were going to do The Eagle Has Landed. And they were looking for young stunties to be part of Michael Caine's group right the way through the film. So they could play the part, but then when somebody's got to fall down the stairs, fall out the building, get caught on fire, whatever, that would be us. And she managed to get me an interview with, with uh, the director, John Sturgis. Now, John Sturgis was a hero. I mean, John Sturgis directed The Magnificent Seven. My, you know, I, I worshipped that film. I saw it 17 times. I went to the cinema 17 times to see the group. So now I'm working with a man I consider to be seriously God and Michael Caine and all the other people in it, and I get the part. And kind of, it just went on from there. You know, that was a, that was the 1976, which was the year of the great summer. It just the sun shone from April right the way through to the end of September. It just it was just a fantastic year. So we did. We went to Finland and we did the Russian front stuff out there. And we had Stugs, real Stugs, on, on, on the train there, just as props. And I was much more interested in the Stugs and the motorbikes than I was in... And I'm looking at it and the boys are going, what are you looking at? I said, look, it's a real Stug and blah, 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 blah. And Michael Caine came over to me and he said, you need professional help, don't you? Because <laughs> you're more interested. And I went, yeah, this is great, fantastic. Anyway... We did the whole film. We had a wonderful time. I mean, just a wonderful, wonderful time in it. And uh, and I had my I had a World War Two Jeep, uh, which I'd had for ten years, and that was working on the film. So I was getting paid for having the Jeep on it as well. And you know, I bought myself a brand new Harley Davidson. I thought I was you know king of the hill, really. Finished on that, and I thought I'll ride out to Holland to watch the jumps on a bridge too far because my dad was there and it's going to be the last opportunity to ever see 10 Dakotas actually chucking yeah. guys out and it was all 10 para guys. So I got on my brand new Harley literally with a sleeping bag and two pairs of knickers. I had no intention of doing anything else except going to watch the jumps and riding back and just you know putting some miles on the bike. So I get out to Holland and I'm on the DZ watching these guys training and I knew one of the second assistant directors out there called Roy Button, who's now head of Warner Brothers Europe. But in those days, he was there. And he said, oh, yeah, you're an ex Bapti armor, aren't you? Yeah. Can you come and teach the Dutch guys about weapons? He said, because they haven't got a clue and they're going to be shooting up. at the And these guys were digging the muzzles into the ground, putting blanks in to see how far they could get the stones. To I mean, I thought, Jesus, if they do this with these for real with these guys. So I had to take all these guys to one side and do all that. And I said, look, Roy, I can't do, you can't put me on an extras contract because I'm now on the stunt side of things. So you've got to give me a stunt contract. So I became the most expensive armorer, kind of, on the movie. And uh, and then he said, well, we've got a sequence next week, which is the Ryan, uh, which is the crossing of the Rhine, uh, Cook's Crossing with Robert Redford. Mm -hmm. He said, you better come for that as well because I want you with a BAR up the front, which is a, a tricky weapon if you don't know it. And so I said, all right, fine. Well, so I'm now being paid quite nicely. And a mate of mine's let me stay in his caravan out there. And I've, you know, I'm, I'm recycling the knickers every night because I've only got two per. And, and so we did Cook's Crossing with, with, uh, with Redford. Now, Redford was being paid a million dollars for 10 days work, a, you know, $100,000 a day, right? Wow. Wouldn't get his hair cut because it was the 70s. So they had to tuck his hair up underneath. You can see it, actually, in the film. At one point, you see this, all this blonde hair tucked up underneath his helmet. Wouldn't wear the boots because he said he couldn't move you know athletically enough so they had to get baseball boots and paint them brown carried a wooden rifle and no no nothing in his pouches you can see it's just paper it's very disappointing and he was late that morning so we'd been sitting on the side of the Baal canal from about i think they called us at half past three in the morning to be ready because they were going to close the Baal. the dutch authorities were closing the Baal between eight and nine in the morning it's a very busy waterway so it was a big deal on a sunday morning so we're to make sure that everybody's ready, we're there very early. So we're sitting on the side of the wall from about half past five, and it's freezing cold, and they haven't got us any brew or any food to us because there's thousands of people on this film. So finally, we get down, and he's late, and it's all going rancid. And so we get into the into the boats, and these little boats are supposed to be being paddled. In fact, we had some outboard motors in them and guys dressed up in uniforms, actually, just to get them across them. And so Redford is... <laughs> Redford is in the boat behind us, and um, and we were all 
well pissed off at this point. And and the the, the uh, special effects guy Johnny Evans is in our boat, and I knew Johnny quite well. And and I said, John, because he's towing explosive charges, which are all waterproofed in a kind of sausage, and towing it out. And when it gets near Redford's boat, he's going to set them off because you know there's a, like a thousand mil lens on the other side of the bank, looking at him doing the paddly but hail mary, mother. God, you, you've, you've seen the film. So I said to John, get it closer, get it closer, get it closer. And he goes, no, no, no. I said, get it closer, go on. No, no, no. And we're all giving it, you know. And I was, anyway, I said, now, John. He said, no, no, no. I said, yeah, now, come back. Anyway, this thing exploded, and it was the equivalent of dropping a bathtub of water on Mr. Redford, who was drenched. I mean, absolutely. And he couldn't say anything because he knows there's a thousand mil camera, and he's sitting there with water dripping. And I go, hey, man, and we're all laughing our bollocks off, and. <clears throat> And the boats get taken by the current about 200 yards further down from the beach on the other side, which was now rid with explosives. And all they told the special effects was, when the boats f- hit the beach, f- start firing the, the, the explosions. What they hadn't said, hello, brain, engage, was if they don't actually land on that beach, don't fire them. So we landed 200 yards down and the boats went, oh, well, they've hit the beach, so we'll fire them. So all the bangs went off, completely waste of time. So cut no good so we've now got to go back over to the other side talk to the dutch authorities to close the vial again which is a real favor whilst they reload all the explosions and then we went we started a bit further upstream so that we actually land on the beach and did it the second time but the first after the first one we were told very definitely you do not set off the bang that closed but you know we got around back so that was bridge too far which is really exciting to be at because there were lots of ex-paras who were out there then much younger men obviously 1976 yeah, sure. and um and we got some great stories out of those guys great great stories it was a, a real privilege too to be there with with uh, you know uh, again michael kane was out there you know he's like oh you again and all that going on but there was a, it was it was interesting and uh, you know dickie attenborough was a delightful man called everybody darling darling would you do this darling move over there and we're going to do this and it was a real old show busy guy but um do you know it's a big difference then between like i mean the stunts of then and i mean now we've got sort of there was no cgi or anything no cgi then, so no yeah all... no very differently we we did everything we did everything for real and if you like on bonds we would be there rehearsing for three to four weeks to do that end sequence where there's all the explosions and people falling over and getting shot and all that kind of stuff. Now there's so much of it you can do against green screen. Yeah, sure. And ch- I mean, you still have to do the gags. You know, there's, um, you know, Casino Royale, those guys were still up on that crane for the opening sequence, which was absolutely fantastic, but a huge amount of it was done green screen in the studio as well, which you d- you wouldn't have had that luxury in those days. The camera guys would have had to been up either shooting it from a helicopter, no drones then. Even then there was no drones either. I don't think for Casino Royal, but when we did it, we were there weeks and weeks and weeks rehearsing, which was great fun. I love the fact you just slipped in the Bond films. I mean, going back to, I mean, do you remember? Do you remember the first time you were approached for a Bond film? Then? I mean, surely that must have been. Well, I did. I did um, uh, Thunderball as an armourer. Crikey, see, that's going back to yeah, <laughs> oh, yes, that's a long time ago, Sonny. Um, and then uh, I think. The first one I performed on, I think, p- could have been uh, Octopussy, or it might have been before that. I can't remember. I mean, there's, so was know, that the was that the Roger Moore day, or was that that was Roger Moore? Roger yeah, Moore, and yeah. Th- and that was actually quite a, an unfortunate story because I was doubling for um, uh, 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 an Indian guy whose character was called Gabinda. I can't remember the actor's name. And I was wearing a turban, and I was all, you know, n- nobody worried about being darkened up in those days. It wasn't, it wasn't the political correctness thing. And I'm hacking away with a sword at, at, at Bond on the top of this train. And we were filming it in, in uh, on the Neen Valley Railway in Peterborough, which is a steam railway because it's supposed to be in India. And Bond's double at that time was a guy called Martin Grace, lovely Martin, Irishman, very gentle man, great stuntman. And he was doing the stuff hanging on the side of the train and all that. And they were filming it from a helicopter. And there was supposed to be just a two and a half mile stretch that was clear, didn't have any obstructions close to the line. And then at the end of that, we were supposed to stop and then come back to number ones. Well, we'd done it two or three times. And then uh, the helicopter crew had just set it up right and they'd reached the end of the two and a half mile stretch. And uh, they said, 
keep going, keep going. It looks fantastic, fantastic. And uh, and somebody's just leaning outside my keep going, keep going. And he swung out a little bit too far, and he hit a steel stanchion. And and they sh- stopped the train. He managed to hang on until it stopped, but he would smashed his hip in at least two or three pa- places. And uh, that was you know quite. I mean that was Martin Knacker, but we were the second unit, so we didn't have quite the backup of the first unit. So uh, as we're carrying Martin on the stretcher into the ambulance, I'm actually taking Roger Moore's wig off Martin because it's the only one we've got. I mean this is you know because I know that I'm going to be I'm going to be next in line to double Roger because I'm you know the right size. So I doubled him for the rest of the sequence and. It was quite a salient, salient lesson in, in you know what, just what what can happen when it goes wrong. I was going to say you must get. I mean, there must be times when you get nervous. I mean, like, do you genuinely think, oh, I can't do this, or is there never that thought that crosses your mind when you're doing anything? I've turned down two jobs. One was doubling Peter O'Toole on a on a, a thing called Rogue Mail, up in Wales, and it was a job where there's two towers. Uh, real towers in this castle in Wales, and the idea is he he fires a, a, a bow, uh, an, an arrow with a with a sort of thin line across to his mate through the window, and then pulls it a, a proper rope, and then he climbs out of the window and swings down to the tower as on as the other do, side, yeah. and then climbs up the rope and gets escaped. And I said, "Well, that's fine, but you need to have the rope needs to be susp- you need to put some scaffold up between the two because if you if you try and go from this one to th- and they couldn't get it." They couldn't get the kinetics of, of going from one to the other like that without, without either having a line to slow you up because you're going to be twisting. There's no guarantee yeah, you can put your feet so. on it if you could take the impact when you hit the tower. And they wouldn't spend the money. They said, no, 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 we haven't got that kind of money. And I said, look, I'll come up there with a rigger. We'll work out how to do it. And be fine. no, 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 we haven't got that sort of money. They sent me, they wouldn't send me on a recce. They sent me a picture postcard of the town to show me the town and, and, and a little line dimensions or yes something, with the right? dimensions on it I mean that's how crude it was and I went I'm sorry guys that's you're asking for trouble so there was a, a Welsh stuntman up there and they got him to do it because they were shooting him up. and he said and he, there was a lot of dialogue about oh, London stuntman have got no bottle and all that kind of stuff because I know the makeup girl who was making him up and he was giving it all large and um uh, anyway, he did it for real. He tied the rope round himself and just launched himself. And of course, he hit the the other tower like a sack of shit. And now the thing has tightened up, and he's hanging there. He's completely unconscious because he'd broken four ribs and oh, his well, collarbone, and he, he'd fractured his skull. And he was unconscious. And they didn't have enough rope to lower him. They tried to get him up to the top, and they couldn't get him through the the window because he was completely unconscious. So they had to run down and get some more rope, run up there, tied on, so they could lower him down to the floor. Which technically, they, when they said he was almost not breathing when they got him, and eventually they got him going, they got him in the ambulance and everything. But that was the end of his career. So I kind of feel for that one, I made the right decision. <laughs> it's probably the right decision. Yeah, yeah, but you know, you kind of you got to know when it's not your day. This is not. This is silly. This is somebody being, you know, wistful thinking about something, and mm. they've got no idea. So I imagine as a director, you just want to get bigger and bigger. Yeah, yeah, time, yeah. Don't you? yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. So going going back to a Bond a sec, because I'm going to have to ask you about obviously GoldenEye. It is the uh, we we use super We're excited about tanks, aren't we? Richard? Yeah. Well, I just want to talk about this this particular tank at the moment. Yeah, absolutely. I mean that sequence in GoldenEye. For those that don't remember, it was the St Petersburg, wasn't it? it was yes. Films. Yeah. Well, St Petersburg and Leaves and Studios. Okay. Because yeah. you're going to spoil originally it <laughs> we were going to shoot no we were going to shoot the whole thing out there and the, and they had paid Barbara Broccoli had paid this huge. Um, amount of money to, to, to the St. Petersburg authorities to uh, to be able to film out there. And so it was all locked in place with contracts and this, that and the other. And then once it was locked into place, they then came back and said, oh, by the way, if you want to shoot down there, it's another one and a half million dollars. And she said for one for, and for a half... For a day? Well, for, the, for that sequence. For that sequence, okay, yeah. So she said for a million and a half, I can build St. Petersburg <laughs> in Leaves and Studios, which is what she did. She did, yeah. So we went out there and shot... The stuff that we had to shoot in it was a you know minimal in St Petersburg, and of course one of the sequences to make it work was going alongside the canal there, the river, canal, river, whatever. It was freezing cold. There were still small icebergs floating down the river, but they said you can't bring a T fifty five down there 
because it's going to go through. You've got to have something lighter. So they built two T55s based on Saladin chassis. Oh, okay. But they had, you know, moving tracks and the whole... T- I mean, the whole thing was built to scale. I mean, it was an enormous project to do that for two shots. Two shots. And we had two of them in case one broke down. So so I'm actually effectively driving the Saladin and you turn the motor on to get the tracks to go round. You know, mm-hmm, all this kind of stuff. And... Um, uh, and then I'm chasing these these jeeps, which are now reversing, firing AKs at us, and we've got bullet hits all over it and all that kind of stuff. It wasn't fun at all, I promise you. <laughs> um, and uh, and then we revert to you know the the property 55 on the other bank, and and we had all these uh, English stunt men and Russian stunt men, and, and it was an extraordinary experience. I mean, extraordinary experience. And every time we drove the T55 anywhere, there were any civilian cars parked there, all these burglar alarms would go off. <laughs> <laughs> and um, and anyway, the the net net was that on on one of the Sundays that we were shooting there, the the, the authority said no, you can't go on any further. We want some more money. So the producer went to the mayor's house. This is on Sunday morning. We'd been there at seven o'clock, and we, we can't wait. So he's gone to the mayor's house with an interpreter, knocked on the door, and the mayor's come out in his dressing gown, and he said, "Let me tell you the power of the Bond movie." means that I can have this on the front page of every picture gl- uh, paper globally tomorrow to say that you've held us to ransom. Here's $10,000 in cash. Go inside and make the phone call, and we expect it. And sure enough, half an hour later, we, we continue shooting. So that was an interesting idea on the dynamic of filming. How do you get it to slide? I've been driven, obviously, a lot of tanks in my lifetime. How do Because tanks just don't slide like that. Was there some secret to it? You see sequences of it coming around corners, and it's almost like broadsiding it at some point. If I told you that. <laughs> oh, I is, it, is it a secret? Is it? It's like, no, yeah. I'll, tell you, I'll tell you how we did it. So they said you have to run the tank on rubber track pads. Yeah. Cause there is no rubber track pads. There's a lot of cobbled streets in it in Pittsburgh, and it's got a lot, of, a lot of cobbled streets. Yeah, as well a lot of cobbled Pittsburgh. streets, but just, they, they just said we can't you know, afford you. It's a very heavy tourist area. You, you need to have rubber tracks. So I sat down with a special effects coordinator and uh, we worked out, we got a couple of links of Chieftain track and we worked out the pitch of that and we found that the Chieftain track, the horns are too wide. But if we cut the horns off on the inside track so they didn't actually rub against the bodywork and we got some sprockets made up with the right gaps for that, the Chieftain track would work. And that's what we did. So we got... Machine sprockets made up for so the you rear. Cut the horns off. Each yeah, cut off. I, cut, I spent forever. the whole day <laughs> with a gas axe cutting the inside <laughs> horns say. off so that it would clear, and then we put the the tracks on. Now we've got brand new track pad rubbers, which are too grippy. So now I take each of the tanks out every day, and I'm sl- because the T55 has got a two speed rear axle. You you bang the left side of the uh, on the left side of the diff in, and it will. That's what'll make it turn very sharply. So I was out there doing turn, endless turns to get the rubber down to a level where it was still rubber, but there was less rubber on the road and bits. It was a real fine point. And then we started experimenting with buckets of half fairy liquid and half water or diesel or... And I can't remember now what the mix is that worked. Secret, magic but mix. eventually... But you'd have been hard pushed if you hadn't had that two-speed rear axle on that. You'd have been hard pushed to do it with a, some tanks that didn't work like that. But with a T55, it was perfect. Bang! That that left or right track stopped, and it would start to drift. And so you know, and then you had to start you know learning how to dance with it because it was obviously it's a big old lump if it gets you know tied up in knots. And uh, so we would you know put the cameras back, and then. As we got the hang of each one, then the cameras would start to creep forward a bit, creep forward a bit, so we could get the, the dynamism of a wide-angle lens on it rather than shooting it on a, safely on a long lens. But again, that was, that's what Bond was all about. They just said, tell us what you need and we'll get it for you. Now it's all like, oh, no, you've got to indent that. We've got, you want a couple of screwdrivers, you put, you know, put the purchase order in and all that. No, and really? literally like, yeah, they just said, do what, get whatever you need. Because they were shot. always synonymous. When I always remember, I mean, my father was a huge, it was like a family treat. It was the, you know, the new Bond film, you go as a family to the cinema, and it was yeah. the biggest and best yeah. and most, you know. It, yeah, absolutely. Stunts were incredible. Yeah. So of all those vehicles you've driven then or been part of, was that, do you think, one of the favourite you ever got your hands on or... Yeah, I mean, it was. A, I enjoyed that more than any other Bond film. But Pierce is an old mate of mine. I knew <laughs> Name him a, a drama, no, but a drama <laughs> school. You know, I mean, I knew him when he was when he, we, you know, absolutely nothing and nobody. 
and we used to hang around together and, and yada yada. So when he came to do Goldeneye, which is his first Bond, there's a sequence where in the opening sequence you see uh, a, a, a mate of mine, Wayne Michaels, does the dive off the dam. Do you remember that? I mean, yeah, it's yeah, spectacular, yeah, right? Yeah. And then you see him come through the ceiling of this this Russian, and there's a there's a Russian bloke sitting on the carsey with his trousers around his ankles reading a paper, and Pierce went. I know who's going to be sitting on the car. I, well, thank you very much, just to get his own back. So that was the start of it. And then we had, we just had a lot of fun. You know, there was a lot of, um, uh, Gary, who was the principal driver of the tank, you know, I taught him how to drive the tank. And then, and then, we, you know, we drove it uh, uh, together. And, uh, uh, you know, he was fantastic. I mean, absolutely fantastic. Um, and, uh, you know, Pierce was, he was just having fun. He'd been doing that Remington Steel show in America. Oh, for of course, years. yeah, yeah, yeah. And they'd wanted him to do the previous Bond, but but MTM, which is Mary Tyler Moore's production company, who, who were doing Remington Steel, wouldn't let him out of his contract. Otherwise, he would have done the previous yeah, one. Right. So they did another one with Roger, and then they retired Roger, and Pierce came on board, and it was just a giggle. And and Martin, the director, I'd known since he was a a young art director, so I'd known him for years, and so. There was a relationship there, and the second unit was great. We had such fun. Ian Sharp, who was the second unit director, who'd done I'd done the professionals with him and and Sweeney's and all that kind of stuff. Bodie you know. and Doyle was that the professionals? Yes, Bodie and Doyle. That's not uh, yeah. Um, and uh, so there were lots of mates, you know. And Harvey Harrison, who was who was uh, uh, one of the cameramen I'd known for donkeys years. So and the special effects guys were all, so we had a good time. We had a good time at that, but. It was quite, you know, it was, it was hairy. It was hairy at times, you know, because you have 55 tonnes of, of, of uh, not 55 tonnes, sorry, a T-55 is, a, you know, a big chunk of yeah, steel. Yeah, absolutely. And we're giving it rock all, and we had three of them. So um, uh, at one point I had uh, Eddie Kidd, who'd now, you know, Eddie Kidd, the motorcycle Most jumper. Yeah, yeah, he was working as a stuntman on the show. And Eddie was just a, a wonderful character, but he would, Never stop rabbiting, particularly if it was girls. It was just all over him like a cheap sponge, you know. And um, and I had a, one sequence where I'm now directing the second, helping the you know as a second unit stunt coordinator, and Gary's driving the tank. And and there's a sequence where there's a huge, great Perrier truck full of of Perrier water, which Perrier had given us, you know, the, the whole lot, a thousand. We all drank Perrier for months and months afterwards, <laughs> and the tank drives right the way through it. But as it's coming down the street and he's getting up to speed, I wanted a car to pass in front, and that was Eddie. But he was behind a building, so he couldn't see the tank. And I said, Eddie, watch me, and I'll give you the cue. When I drop my hand, you go across in front of the tank. And Eddie was, yeah, 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 fine. And he's talking to somebody here. And he missed the cue, and I go, Eddie, don't go. And he thought I was giving him the cue. And he, uh, he <laughs> the tank missed him by inches <laughs> because he wasn't. You know, he was giving it too much of that and not enough. Yeah, anyway, there were all sorts of things like that that happened. And, and at one point, one of the boys stalled when we were in Russia, just going in front of the tank. And, and Gary was driving and I was, you know, directing with, with Ian Sharp. I was coordinating that sequence. And Gary's pulled every... And you don't stop that tank easily. And he's come up right up to it here. And there's no room to go left or right because there are other cars here. And, he's got, and he literally came up and just nudged it and rolled into the wheel. And it was like, oh. Thank you, Lord. I mean, but we were doing it for real. Now you see, gee, that crossing car. You know, you put it in in post production and no risk and everything else. But then it was proper job. So, Jim, on the subject of historical accuracy, now there's one thing in movies that really gets my go. It's when you can see stuff that a wasn't even there in that period, or it's the wrong thing being used, or in relation to vehicles, you've got these sort of like hybrid vehicles which clearly are not the right vehicle. Um, how do you feel about that sort of thing? Look, it's very easy to criticise things and you look at things like the Battle of the Bulge and Patton where it's all M48 tanks done up with a cross on it, whether they're American or German and all that kind of stuff. And for 90% of the people who are looking at it, they wouldn't know the difference anyway. But I now certainly I feel that with the advent of, of CGI and the fact that there are a lot more collectors now who've restored and who drive original vehicles, there's almost no excuse for getting it wrong because you look on the internet in the old days again your reference 
was a lot of books and you had to plow through miles and miles of pages of books to get unless you knew and you'd studied it like some of us who you know and it used to drive me mad on films just the basic things like germans carrying an mp40 and they'd have rifle ammunition pouches because the the costume department said well those are what they they wore in the picture and i said yeah that's what they wear in the picture when they've got an, a mauser 98k but these are oh we don't have those oh well okay fine so it was the inaccuracies were criminal as far as i was concerned but then eventually uh, it was interesting working on private ryan because i went in when the the film started i went into the production office and looked around at some of the drawing and i thought oh my goodness me they've actually got some people who know what they're doing and so we had people like webbing wranglers for german webbing and American, a webbing wrangler a webbing <laughs> wrangler okay okay the uniform guys knew what they were talking about. They really did. And they were triple sharp. And if in, anybody was trying to put something in there that was the wrong... I mean, those combat vests that the Rangers wore. In yeah, thing, yeah. We got hold of an original one. We had some made up exactly to that specification. I think in Italy, funnily enough. And then put them on a piece of rope and dragged them around the field behind a jeep for an hour or so to get them looking battered and, and worn in those sort of places. They had... Uh, the, in the in the airborne jackets, there's a little pocket here in the, in in uh, up on the top here, which ha has, contains a little knife, so that if you get hung up in a tree and you can't actually reach your 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 boot knife, oh, okay. you've got a little thing here that you could cut away your rigging lines. Now, who would know that? But they put the pocket in, and they got some of the they found some of the original knives and they put them in just so that the actors could feel that they had everything that would have been happening. And they, when you go to that sort of detail. It's so exciting to work on on things like that, where they they're finally doing it right. The uniforms are, are pretty much there, and the and the vehicles, you know, are pretty much there. With obviously, with the exception of the tiger, which I know that Spielberg, when he first saw the dummy tigers, was disappointed. He said, oh, "I thought the tiger was as big as a house, and you know, everybody because of this mystique, the tiger yeah, right no, of course, yeah." Um, and although they were only the the ones that because they were built on the T thirty four chassis were about two and a half feet shorter, but it was pretty much the same dimensions otherwise. Um, and uh, uh, that was the only thing that kind of, every time I look at that in a film, I think, Ugh, somebody should have done more to have actually put, you know, out, outer road wheels on it and made it a little bit, because it was so... So very much T thirty four when you looked at it. And that was, was that, that final scene, isn't it, where he's, he's on the bridge as well, and it's coming towards him, and uh, yes. yeah, 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 and all that. But when he blows the track off, yeah, you oh, know, yeah the sticky bomb, and, the um, sticky bomb yeah. on the track, and he blows the track off, and and you can see these great big flappy, you know, Russian track pads going flop, 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 and like, oh, matron, um, which was you know seriously disappointing. And I was driving the tank at that point. Because then uh, Tom Hanks comes up and he fires a Tommy gun through the, the vision slit. And give him his due, he was very concerned about, you know, the fact that I was going to be in there. And I said, don't worry, Tom, I've got, you know, I've got, uh, uh, you know, wax and I've got, because I couldn't be seen, obviously, in there. So I didn't have to wear the uniform. I said, and don't worry, I'll be down on the floor when that thing comes through. But it's still, the noise was incredible firing a 45 caliber thompson you know about four feet from your ear and that's why i've got two hearing aids and you know things like that because i was also driving the half track which blows up when we first meet private ryan oh, yeah, I was yeah, driving yeah, the yeah. 251 copy half track was actually an ot810 for those people who are into all that it's a czech copy of it um and when the start when the special effects guy says to you there's going to be a bit of a bang because normally they go, no, 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 it's nothing. And this massive explosion. You said it was nothing. No, that was nothing. Wait. And then when they say to you, there's going to be a bit of a bang, you think, mm, hello. So I've wedged or, uh, as much wax as I can get into my ears. Then I've put on a pair of, of, of you know, ear defenders and everything. Because, again, I'm in the half track. I can't be seen. Even though, but even then, the wardrobe guys insisted I wore the SS uniform right down to the boots. He said, just in case. And that's the detail, you know, that's that, That's about detail. But in this case, I wore everything. But when that bang went off, I mean, I liken it to being inside a dustbin and four guys hit the outside of it with baseball bats. I mean, it was an incredible <laughs> noise. I was like, blah, blah, blah. And it had to, after the explosion went off, I had to drive about another 30 feet and then slow down and stop. So I'm going, oh, and my ears are ringing and everything. Anyway, it was, that was quite an interesting experience, but... 
beautifully done. Beautifully done. And all the stunt guys were told, when you get hit, imagine you're a puppet and that somebody's just cut the strings. We don't want any of that Hollywood rubbish with and all arms flailing up. That's not what happens. So when they go, you just see them flop and drop. Yeah, and it certainly comes across in the movie, doesn't it? Yeah, it's, it does. Um, yeah, and fantastic. Absolutely. And having worked previously with Spielberg on, on Indiana Jones films, 20, like 15 years beforehand, and everything was very much... Um, you know, we used to, we used to, they used to put a board up in the morning and they said, we're doing this shot, this shot, because he'd done an animatic back in the States and he'd virtually edited the whole film and we were just shooting it for real. And then on Private Ryan, there were like three, sometimes four units and he'd come in in the morning and say, right, we're one up there. So there was a much more flexibility to take in to account of what was happening on the set and where things were and all that kind of stuff. And it was just fascinating. And I drove another tank on that, which comes over the brow of a hill and, and one of the boys hits it up the arse with a bazooka and then it, and, it, and it explodes again, you know. And I thought, I'm getting typecast here. <laughs> because I drove, the last one I drove was, was, the, was the self-propelled gun, the Marda, which has got the open fighting compartment at the back. And the guy, and they throw the Molotov cocktails into it, and the crew are all, you know, are on fire and rolling over the sides and all that. And I'm driving it, and I'm looking. I went, I sat in it to start with, and I could see daylight through the through the the hatches. So I thought, if somebody gets it wrong, I'm going to get burning petrol coming through here onto me. So I wear my fire suit. So I wore my fire suit, and I had a little small fire extinguisher in there with me as well. And sure enough. It all happened, bang, and there's pour, fuel pouring right into my lap, right into the family allowance. And so I'm, and, and again, Simon, the, the second unit director, wanted me to, the sunk one, they wanted, wanted me to keep driving. So I'm now spraying my crotch with CO2 to put the fire out, wriggling uncomfortably like hell to get to the end of, I'm kind of going, because I can't open the hatch until it, we hear cut, you know. And I thought, yeah, okay, mm, crutch on fire. This is something to tell your grandchildren about, isn't it? But it was a privilege to work on that show because, it, we, you know, we, we're really doing something that... that and all these things, I mean, obviously incredibly orchestrated for safety in that, I'd imagine. But, I mean, the sheer cost of putting it all together, what if... I mean, there must be times when you're doing something and it goes, it goes wrong, it goes tits up for whatever reason, and you have to do it all over again. Is it like... It must be huge expense involved and yeah, hassle and aggro. And, yeah, uh, it is. Huge expense. So in your mindset, it's, I've got to get it right the first time. Yes. I mean, everybody. And, and they, uh, you know, uh, uh, but they always allow, on a picture like that, they allow for take two or take three. Oh, if they okay. get it on the first yeah. one, hurrah. But otherwise, they're going to go back and do it again because they've got the money to for everybody to stand around scratching their butts until they reload everything and do it again. Where on The Pianist, yeah, which is yeah. a film I did in, 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 in uh, Germany at Babelsberg with Roman Polanski, which was a you know true story about the, the Warsaw Ghetto. And um, I'd uh, rehearsed with the, we, the first day on the film was one of the major battle scenes. I mean, talk about going into it heads up. And I'd rehearsed some of the stuff the previous day, but we'd run out of light um, and I hadn't been able to rehearse everything the stuntmen I got, and it was all going on in one take because it's supposed to be Spillman's point of view, so you couldn't cut cameras. Yeah, yeah, sure, yeah. And the one thing we didn't have on the rehearsal day was the tank. And I said in the, the, the morning that we started to film, I said to Roman, "Look, I, you know, Roman, I need to rehearse the tank so he can see what's happening because he's just looking through a letterbox." And Roman got quite upset and said, "I want to shoot, I want to shoot," and I said, "Well." that's fine but if we do this and it doesn't work a I, i'm not prepared to you know have him run over anybody and b it's going to take two or three hours to reload all the special effects and everything else and it, it, it can you just give me 45 minutes he got you know oh I have your 45 and it was very offhand anyway i knew the tank driver because i'd been out there doing enemy at the gates the year before and he was a really nice switched off switched on guy who spoke english and so I, I, I ran him through it and I said, you know, there's two guys running in front of you. When the second guy runs, then you can go. If you don't see that second guy, don't go because he may have fallen under the tracks. So anyway, we did that and 45 minutes later, come back and I said to Roman, we can, you know, we can go now. Thank you, sir. And he was very kind of, oh, now you're ready for me and all this stuff. So, okay. So we did it anyway. We did it and it worked. Thank God. Thank you, Lord. 
it worked and we got it you know in one take in that master take and he came up afterwards and said thank you I, I, I realized that now you tell me about tanks and guns and what we can do here and I'll do my thing and, and it was a fantastic relationship and it was an extraordinary thing but principally it was because they hadn't paid for that tank to be there for that rehearsal day if they had done that then we could have started at 7 30 that that morning as soon as it was light and done the shot you know and I suppose we'll have to talk a little bit briefly about Fury. Um, so it was sort of not that long ago now. In fact, no, it was going on five a bit years now, ago. five years ago. I mean, that for me, I have to say, I mean, because you, as you said before, there's always critics who will knock every single film. But for me, the accuracy of that, I mean, using Tiger 131 from Bovington, yep. using the Sherman, one of the Shermans was from Bovington as well. Yeah. Um, I mean, for that to work on, it must have been an absolute it joy, was, I imagine. It was really interesting, really exciting. We had some lovely um, light dragoons who came to man the tanks and BTCs as well who'd been out in Afghan well, the and RTR they were, weren't available or uh... Uh, well the um, <laughs> you know RTR I mean, they've got too much money and they don't they didn't need to work you know they're a very rich regiment but the, the light dragoons guys um, were absolutely and I was a bit sceptical because they weren't film orientated they'd never been on a film set in their lives yeah. before but their their command and structure of actually doing, you know, what needed to be done with the tank. And the tank drivers were owner drivers. So again, they were not inducted into the military system so much. But when these guys began to talk to them in the right language, everything came into place. So we had light dragoon tank commanders, except for one actor in, in the thing. And then Brad's crew, who again, I took them for days on, on driving around and I made them switch positions and everybody knew what they were doing. And I spent, I've got a little bit of film of them rehearsing on the first day just how to get into the tank just for brad to become familiar yeah. with how he got up the front of the tank and so he looked like he'd done it a few yeah. hundred times yeah. before and yeah. i did it yeah. again and again and again and again and i was tired of putting the watch on and you know okay you're 24 seconds come on guys i need you in there ready to go in 12 and a half 13 seconds max and we worked and we worked and we worked like that um and that was that was great you know because they had a, a, a they they took them as well they had a, a, a kind of preschool where they took they, they took them out and they made them bivy at night and oh, really? and eat rat packs and all that kind of stuff and and toughen them up and and one or two of them really 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 got into it big time um, and one of them actually didn't wash for the entire film he said well this is how they would have lived <laughs> yeah, yeah. and eventually the, you know he got this huge boil came up on his back and the doctor said look you know you haven't been acclimatizing yourself for a year like these guys have you know you're doing it you know you need to have a shower. It was interesting. Um, and, but they lived in the tank a lot of the day. They would have their meals in the tank and they would pee into a, into a box and all that kind of stuff and they would stay in the tank together. And at lunchtime, when we broke for lunch, you'd just see, because Brad liked to have a cigarette and one of the other guys was a smoker and you'd see smoke just filtering out. through. The, then you knew that the boys were in there chatting or making phone calls or whatever it was. It was I mean, it was bizarre in a way. But it was kind of hard work because we had three different engine configurations there. You know, we had radials and we had diesel and we had petrol and a multibank engine, the only multibank engine that I've ever seen running. And this guy had rebuilt it. I mean, what a, you have no idea the complexity of a multibank engine until you see one or photographs of one in pieces. I mean, it's unbelievable. And Adrian, the guy who owned the tank, had done this. And it, it just ran like a Swiss watch. That was the tank. If you ever wanted to do close-ups of tanks turning... We got Adrian's tank, and we, you know, we ran that. Whereas the twin diesels on Fury, one of them was very tired, and she started smoking quite seriously. And the last day on the film, it was like a smoke screen coming down the road. And I mean, the whole thing packed up. I mean, it, she just held out till the last day of shooting. But it was it, it was a great experience. And David Ayer, the director who wrote the script, actually put together a whole series of scenarios which he'd read in a book called Death Traps, which was written by a guy who was in charge of tank repair from Normandy to the end of the war in the 2nd Armoured. And he would drive up in a jeep at night and say, right, we can rob parts off that one to make this one work, and they'd pull them back. And there were various incidents that he talks about in the book, and David Ayer had put some of those together to make part of the story for Fury, but that's what he based it on. And they were all proper events that actually happened and so when you saw the sequence with the guy um gets hit with a panzerfaust with a hitler youth mm -hmm. blows yeah, that yeah, up when yeah. you see him coming out of the turret on fire and he rolls off the back deck 
that was based on a little piece of film that you can see on YouTube of this of this panther tank that they engaged in, uh, just outside Cologne Cathedral in the last days of the war. And you see a guy in a Sherman that's hit by the panther and he rolls out of the top of the turret with actually with his leg missing left leg missing from the knee down but he's also on fire and you see him roll over the back deck and off onto the ground um before a m more jackson or something came in and engaged the, the panther but it's all there on eight millimeter film you can see it on youtube it's a fascinating little section of film but again that was based on that so he put all these little vignettes into the film that actually happened so that was a uh, that was a really good experience again because he was well into it. David Ayo is a collector and a World War II buff, as is his producer. And between the two of them, they said we're going to get this right. And I think most of the time, we we did, you know, we did get it right. Yeah, and it certainly came across in in that particular movie as well. Now, you you sort of said there's history buff and that. You've obviously got a genuine love and passion for history as well. The military service, I believe you've owned a few vehicles yourself yes. in your lifetime as well. Yes, and I still drive them. I have a, a, a German BMW R75 motorcycle outfit, which I first rode on the Dirty Dozen and fell in love with. I said, I've got to have one of these motorcycles. And I actually finished up buying that particular one that I rode on the Dirty Dozen after... A bridge too far because it, it belonged to the com- that company, that armory company that I used to work for, and I kept on saying to them, "Please sell me that bike." Eventually, he said, "Oh, for God's sake, get off my back!" And he sold the bike to me, and that was in 1976. And I've had and I ride it. I've ridden thousands of miles all over Europe. I've rebuilt it in a minute, and I absolutely love that bike. But I've got a military 45 Harley Davidson, which I bought in 1970, which Brad Pitt was desperate to buy off me in fury. And I said, "Even you don't have enough." You say you show me the we were having a coffee, uh, and you you show me a photo of. Brad Pitt riding this bike. My you, ass, well, he was riding my ass really really upset at that, next yeah. to him, yeah. <laughs> and I think, oh, are you okay? Because, you know, you're clunking the gears a bit and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> but uh, anyway, he eventually, I found him another Harley Davidson with the same patina. that Because mine's, I've done 60,000 miles of mine, you know, and it's got patina. And that's what he liked about it. He didn't want a sort of, you know, squeaky new off yeah, of course, factory yeah. floor type bike. And I found him another one towards the end of the film. And then uh, I'd been using my Jeep on the film as a runabout, really, because it, you could park it in shot, and it was not going to cause it a proper job. And then the, the clutch went one day on my birthday. So I didn't have a runabout, so I went and got my R75 and used that as a runabout while I waited for the parts, and we fit a new clutch, etc. And then he said, oh, that's nice, because we didn't have one on the film at that point that ran. We had some dead ones. And so then he, I said, I suppose you want one of these, do you? And he said, yeah, I do. So I managed to get one of those for him built in Germany, but all Malto Immaculato and everything thing, you know. But um, yes, and I've had a duck. I had a duck for 25 years, uh, you know, proper military duck, which crossed the channel in that for the 50th anniversary of D-Day with about nine other ducks. It took us seven and a half hours. And uh, we've ridden that up the Rhine and up the Seine and all those places. I had great fun with that, you know, but I'm a little bit too old to climb in and out of that now. But I had, you know, great. And I had a uh, an Achilles Sherman um, for a while and... I've had a track jeep and you know various. I've got a cat, still got a cat and crowd, a track motorcycle, German oh, well. track motorcycle, cool, and, a, now, and some other motorcycles. Again, military. So yes, I sort of a long way of saying yes. <laughs> do you ever? I was asked to ask you this question. So souvenirs from all this multitude of movies. Do you ever? Do you ever steal anything? You're not allowed to say. Do you ever take souvenirs? Uh, the you, only, you, you'd have to no, say. No, I mean, no, if the only got souvenirs <laughs> I've got. No, no, no. I have got Donald Sutherland's dog tags. From, oh, wow. from the Dirty Dozen. Yeah. And his character's name in that was Vernon Pinkley. And I've got those dog tags. I've got um, uh, that guy who was in Dallas, who was in The Eagle Has Landed. Um, uh, you know, JR. I can't remember the actor's name. Oh, I crikey. Um, I know exactly who you know. Who yeah, 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 yeah. Anyway, yeah. I've got his uh, fiberglass M1 carbine that he carried in that. Um and a few bits and pieces from from Indiana Jones. In fact, I had an Indiana Jones stunt hat because I was one of the villains in the boat chase that we did on that. And Harrison's hat kept on blowing off the stunt ones that he got, and we pick it up out of the water, and then we get. And eventually, when we finished, it, they had five or six of them. And eventually, on the last day, I picked it out of the water, and then Spielberg said, "You know what? This hat's causing us a problem. Let's say he's he doesn't do the fight with the hat on, and he must, it it appears later, and we don't ask the question about it. So I'd put this hat." In, back in the boat and then we carried on forgotten all about it and then when we finished on the on the film um it uh, uh, uh you know the wardrobe truck had gone and i was getting my pads out from the boat and 
there was a hat and I thought oh, I'll put it on so I yeah I, I inherited that one but there's I wish I didn't a lot more because I didn't realize there's all these film nuts out there some seriously well we, we, we were having dinner together last night and um, one of our crew I mean we've not even mentioned it we're sort of running out of time but obviously with Star Wars nuts I mean you have met some passionate I imagine fans of Star Wars um, just very briefly tell us tell us what your part in Star Wars was I was a, I was a stunt stormtrooper in the original Star Wars running around with these sets that wobbled and, and you know in this incredibly uncomfortable and hot plastic outfit and you couldn't sit down because if you did something went up your bum and and so you had to stand most of the day take the helmet off and, the, and then you to stop the helmet every time you nodded your head the, the hell you are looking at the floor or looking at the so you had to put more foam rubber into it to keep it tight on your head and of course you sweated more and more. I mean it was just a, a very uncomfortable exercise and thought what a load of rubbish this is going to be you know well <laughs> seriously we thought this is going to be worse than Doctor Who seriously um, and Harrison thought his career was finished he really, nobody had any idea until we went to the crew showing and we actually saw the completed item. And then it was just like, oh my goodness me, this is really something outstanding. And you were telling me that you've been to a convention or two about it, you've been invited yeah, to... Yeah, but um, I, the first time, about eight years ago, ten years ago, somebody rang me up uh, out of the blue and said, would you come and sign autographs? And I said, no, I'm not an actor, I'm a stuntman, we, do, we don't do that. He said, no, 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 we'd really like you to come to this Star Wars convention at, at Olympia. And I thought, you, I said, are you going to pay me? He said, yeah. All right, and I've got a flat just around the corner from Olympia. So it's two minutes walk. Fine. So I turn up, not knowing what to expect, and there's all these um, guys that I, I knew from the film. You know, little Kenny Baker and, and 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 you know various people and Jeremy Bullock and people I haven't seen for long. So they're all chatting, and I don't know what we're in for. And they put me behind this table. And there's a whole load of photographs of of, of stormtroopers and, and and another character that I played in The Empire Strikes Back, where I'm actually something called a Bespin guard. Don't ask me, but a lot of people know all about Bespin guards, right? So the first guy comes to the table, and a great big, big, you know, never miss a lunch bunch guy, and he rolls this this uh, uh, this uh, uh, film poster out, and it's got lots of photo, you know, lots of signatures on it, Dave Prowse and various people on it, and he said, "I need you to sign down here," and I said, "And this this funny accent," and I said, "Where have you come from, mate?" And he said, "Ah, Sydney, Australia." I said, for one day? He said, oh, yeah, I wouldn't miss this one. You've flown from Sydney to get a few autographs? I mean, these people do need professional help. <laughs> so I've signed the autograph, and then they've taken a tenner off him per signature. I mean, ah, oh, now I'm beginning to get how That's this where you works. Where you from, yeah. Right? So the next guy, I say, where have you come from? Aston, Texas? I said, for t yeah, sure. And there was this just this catalogue of strange people who were Star Wars fans who travel wherever is necessary to get a few signatures and since then i've been to japan paid for to sign sign things and you go there and they like to dress up in the costume but you've got people dressed as wookies who are a foot shorter than i am right and they come along and, and then you've got darth vader and now you can buy a darth vader helmet which distorts your voice and makes what you're saying sound like darth i mean it's just whatever well you know whatever gets you <laughs> So unfortunately, Jim, we're starting to run out of time. So what's what's the future hold for you? What's the, the big life Look, plan? I'm of an now? age. What is the future? Well, I'm of an age. I'm still working, luckily. Yeah. And uh, 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 you know, I was going to say, I tried to get hold of you a few weeks ago and you were in Kazakhstan. Or I was something. in Kazakhstan so, yeah. doing a commercial for the new Land Rover Defender, which is out now, so I'm allowed to talk about it, which was fascinating. Ninth biggest country in the world and only five, pe five million people there, you know, driving for hours and not seeing another car in this, this extraordinary environment. That was good fun. Um, I was working on a one of those superhero films the other day, driving a, a you know Bentley, and two weeks ago I was driving a Rolls Royce four x four for an Ed Sheeran video. I'd never heard of Ed Sheeran. Isn't that a terrible <laughs> thing? I, he's a very nice man, very very nice man. I liked him enormously, um, and the ragging this four x four around a field, spinning it, and doing all that three hundred grand's worth of Rolls Royce, right? And the most the weird thing was that suddenly this slightly strange voice comes out from the radio saying if you do that again I'm going to switch the car off and the guy from the dealership was watching for on the video inside I don't know how this worked and the guy's going don't do that again you're messing the car up and he could have switched the car off from where we were in the middle of this field in Hertfordshire somewhere it was extraordinary so yeah and I'm still doing I do EastEnders a bit and uh, occasionally casualty and shows like that I, I as long as the phone goes I, I love it I do love it 
Richard, I do so, love so it. So no plans for retirement then? You can't see that on the oh, Sorry, I don't mention the R word. We don't, <laughs> we don't do that, no. No, because I, there's, there's so much going on out there. And, I, you know, I'm involved with the Wheeled Foundation and, and, you know, we've got the Ag Panther that was at, at yeah, Tankfest yeah. this year and we've got some extraordinary projects. We're restoring three German armoured cars, two four-wheeled and one six-wheeled armoured cars. And in five, three to four years, hopefully, we'll have those three up and running, restored to a level the same as the JP. Mm-hmm. Everything works, the correct optics, the guns. We, we want to get the KWK firing, we, which we've already done on that, the 20 mil KWK. And um, that's the sort of level of restoration that we do in the Wheeled Foundation. We're, an, uh, we're a live museum. Everything that we have there works. 250s, 251s, Schwimmwagen, Kuhwagen, Kettenkrads, you know, one ton, half tracks, everything runs. We've got two Stugs. We've got one Stug that came out from under the Black Sea and was retrieved in the 90s, completely restored by Mike Gibbs guys, uh, right down to the fact that he found two members of the of the Rush, of the German unit that the Stugs were on the way to when they were sunk in the Black Sea. He found a member of the Russian um, submarine that torpedoed it and a member of the German ship, so, and put all that together. So it's not just about the vehicles, it's about the history. Mm. And that's what fascinates me, is the history. We restored a... Uh, um, a type, a, uh, type 23 Horsch staff car, which appeared at first glance to have actually been issued to Rommel in the desert. Beautiful restoration. I mean, cost God knows what. Long story about that one, but you know, we haven't got time to go into that. But we found Rommel's driver, Hermann von Leipzig, still alive, living in Namibia, who speaks perfect English. And we flew him over... To, for the launching of the vehicle in Germany when the restoration was finished. Mr. Von Leipzig came in, and then he was in his 80s then, this is about 12 years ago. And he came in and we pulled the curtains back and he looked at the car and it, it was quite interesting. And then he sat in the car and then the tears started to come down and he started to tell us exactly, A, how he'd switched, moved things around on the dashboard when he'd been driving the car to make things easier ergonomically at night so that he could reach things. And then he told us how... At night, Rommel would get him to drive about a kilometre away from his headquarters and he would sleep on the back seat so he could just be away from the brain damage and Mr. von Leipzig would put a little bivvy up, you know, 50 yards away and he'd cook him some supper and he told us all about the relationship. When it, I mean, that stuff is priceless. I mean, uh, Mr. von Leipzig's dead now. Absolutely, you know, that, those are the things, the stories that come with these vehicles that I find so fascinating. Talking of stories, <clears throat> I mean, we're really, really pushed for time now, but uh, there is a book on the way, I do believe. Yes, I, you know, I, a mate of mine persuaded me and said, you know, you need to do your memoirs. So, um, and I do mean reluctantly because, you know, a lot of memoirs come out just as an eye fest. I did this, I mean mine. And, uh, you know, there's so many things in this industry which have been fascinating and I've been privileged to, to, to share with lots of people. So I'm, I hope it's not. Anyway, it's called Full Burn. It'll be out at Christmas time. I've got you know lots of pictures of silly pictures of things I got up to in the past and and talking about all the rubbish we've been talking about today. So um, yes, hopefully go and buy one. It's a very good Christmas present. Absolutely, go and buy one, Jim. Thank you so much. I mean, it's an absolute pleasure. I have to genuinely say, one of the most humble people I've ever met. Certainly up there with one of the most interesting I've ever met in my life. I feel like I could talk thank to you, you forever. Um, and thank you so much for no, being really. who you are. And, uh, my pleasure. I, I can't wait for the book. And proper really Earl Grey can. tea, I might And, and proper Earl Grey tea. Thank you. <laughs> thank you so much for joining us. Please remember to subscribe to the podcast and follow us on social media for the next episode of Tank Nuts.